Hi everyone, this is Bridget Bolin from Modern Muse for Writers, and I'm thrilled today to do our very first author interview with the wonderful Dr. Gabby Polici. Dr. Gabby has written a fantastic memoir called All This Healing Is Killing Me. Here's the cover of the book so y'all can see that. You can find her on amazon.com as well as other bookstores and book vendors. Um, and today I have the privilege of chatting with Gabby about our experience of coaching together, writing the manuscript and uh, preparing for book number two. Hi, Gabby. Hi, Bridget. So happy to be here with you today. Oh, thank you. Me too. So wonderful to get to see you again and spend some time with you. I've missed you since we've uh, ended up a few time. <laughs> But it's a good ending. It's a happy ending because you have a book that is not only a manuscript draft, it's published, it's out. Show it to everybody again. Yes. Killing me. <laughs> and you can tell your audience that it's a number one Amazon bestseller yes. in uh, the category of depression as a number two Amazon new release bestseller in the category of women's memoirs and biographies. It's doing really well. It's getting five-star reviews across the board. So I can't be more pleased with the outcome. It's really a very just heartwarming outcome for this project. Well, it feels to me like it's right on the mark because I know this story inside and out now, and I know you and, and how much of your heart and your passion are in this book. And I just say kudos to you. And I'm so grateful that readers are finding it and that are responding in the way that you and I had both kind of felt that they would and hope that they would. Tell us yeah. a little about this fantastic catchy title. You know, we talk in book marketing about having to find like a hook, right? And I think you got the hook right there in your, your titles. So tell us how you got the title and the meaning behind it and anything that you want to convey to the readers just by that title alone. Yeah, I had a different working title while I was doing the draft. So I had this final version, the one that's published, was a draft that was about 15 years in the making. There was a draft that I wrote in 2007. There was a second draft that I wrote in 2013. There was a third draft that I wrote during the pandemic. And then the one I worked on with you is the kind of final one that's in print now. And the draft I had um, done right before we started working together, the title I was using was called The Repetition of Light, which was something that just felt like this kind of pursuit of light, this pursuit of healing. Um, and when I would say the title to people, there would kind of be this like, huh? Like when the dog goes, huh? Like <laughs> it just like wasn't a resonance and they're just, it wasn't like holding any attention. And just one night, like after coaching with you and like, just kind of like really being in the kind of thick of that revision, that final revision process, this idea of like, all this healing is killing me, just kind of dropped in as like my own reality. And I was like, huh, that's kind of fun. Like, that's a fun title. And I Googled it and no one was using it. And I was like, let's do that. And the really remarkable outcome from that is that now when I say the title, people go, oh, I know what that's like, right? Like people have this visceral response to the title. And even when they just like see it on LinkedIn or social media, they'll send me a message like your title is amazing. Um, and so I think just like one phrase like that alone, even you know, not even accounting for the 60 or 70,000 words that are actually in the manuscript, but just having one phrase that says like, this is my experience. If that has like universal appeal, or if that connects with your audience is something that's true for them too. I think that has huge impact on their attraction to the story and their desire to pick it up. And I had people come up to me, I was at a conference in Austin, Texas, I had women coming up to me saying, Oh, we saw the title of your book. And we were talking about it. That's like, so true for us. And that's been really satisfying, also very unexpected, because it just sort of came out of the process of writing. That's a, a really fascinating response. I know um, what I'm seeing with, you know, many of my transformational coaching clients is there is this sort of like, we hit a quick point or a saturation point, right? Like there's this whole push for us to evolve as hum human beings right now. And even really to evolve into beings of light or home illuminance is the shamanic uh, practitioners of Peru say, and your book is really about that topic, but this idea that as we're evolving, there's all this work we have to do, right? There's the yeah. shedding of these different layers, our past wounds, our traumas, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it can feel, I think at times pretty overwhelming, particularly if you're early on in that, that path. And I think your book is such a testament to uh, that sense of finding a balance perhaps, right? Between doing the work we need to do to grow and evolve, but also finding a place where we can rest and feel perhaps satisfied or, you know, at least um, proud of our accomplishments so far to be able yeah. to 
that space. And I think after COVID, particularly, I think a lot of people are feeling that same sense of like, be nice to take a pause from all the work (laughs) and and sit back and maybe assess how far we've already come before perhaps doing more, right? Yeah. Um, I know you too, you have a PhD, so you've got this whole background in psychology and in, in healing work and in a lot of different uh, body movement therapies and whatnot, yoga, et cetera. Um, so could you say a little bit more about people who are responding to you from that place? Like what is going on for them and how are they connecting? How is your book helping them basically so far? Yeah, I've heard a lot of different things. I had one um, guy call me that I didn't expect to read the book at all because it's like reaching my personal network, right? And um, like some people are picking it up in my personal network that I didn't think would ever read it. And this one guy called me and he was like, I need to talk to you. And I was like, okay, like what's going on? And he's like, your book was so profound. It was unbelievably profound. Like I'm speechless. I don't even know what to say. And I was like, okay, like just start at the beginning. He's like, I've been through a lot of the same things as you. Like, I can't believe like you put it all out there. And like, you made me think that like, I've done a lot of healing work, but there's a lot more work that I need to do. And he's like, I just had all these emotions. I had a really strong emotional reaction to your book. So I'm getting a lot of people reaching out that like want to share their experience. So it's definitely like opening something in people's hearts to like, want to express their own story, which was the mission. And I told you this from the beginning, you were like, Gabby, why are you doing this? And I was like, because I want to evoke something in others that they want to tell their own story, that they want to use writing as their own medicine, which is what it had been for me during the process. And I really do think writing is medicine. And I really do think this process is transformative. And I'm hearing that and I'm seeing that reaction. I have a lot of other people coming up to me, strangers, even saying, how did you do this? Like, I sit down to write my story and I just can't do it. How did you do it? You know? And I think there's more work to be done, whether it's like creating programs or workshops or coaching or something to help people get through this process. Cause I just, I was just grasping at straws. Like I was taking classes and finding different editors and coaches and things. Like I was just grasping to kind of put some kind of you know, plan together for myself to get through the process. And it's really challenging because like you don't know who you can trust and you don't know how much it should cost. And, you know, there's like the whole emotional experience of going through the journey of like telling the story and putting it on the page and sharing it with someone else. And so it's just like, it's taken me to places that I didn't even expect in terms of connecting with others and, and thinking about how to serve people more in the future after they've read the, the memoir. That's wonderful. Can you tell me a little bit about how you connected with an audience through writing the book as you're writing? You talked a lot just a moment ago about having that connection to people as you were writing, right? And I want to point out too, you mentioned you'd started drafting this book back in, what did you say, 2007 or 2017? I lost track there. Zero seven, two zero zero seven. (laughs) We get this finished copy as readers, right? We, we want to buy the books. We buy the book. We get this beautifully like finished, polished copy. And what we don't see is the multiple drafts that go into actually creating this finished, beautiful project. Mm-hmm. And, and so for you know readers who are not writers, I think it can sometimes feel like this is so easy to do. And you spoke pretty eloquently a moment ago about the catharsis, right? Uh, in fact, with my intensive coaching clients, I often joke that you get a free book with purchase when you work with me because is my intention is that you as the author undergo that metamorphosis you were talking about. You, you create or you reach new understandings about yourself, about the world around you. And then ideally that those books go out as like illuminated manuscripts so that you're shedding new light on the human condition for your readers. So was that part of your process? I know you said you were thinking about, as you were writing, you were thinking about the people this is going to reach, right? Say a little bit more if you can about that process of what you embedded energetically in this book, because it does feel like not just emotionally, but energetically energetically, there's a certain like almost frequency or vibration that people can feel as they're reading. So any thoughts you have on that or feedback from your readers so far about, you know, do you feel like they're, they're getting essentially like the vibe you wanted to put out? Yes. (laughs) So I feel like the book was a living entity, like from from back in 2007, like when it descended upon me, it descended upon me. It was like, <laughs> this is going to come through you like a pregnancy, like whether you like it yes. or not, like yes. this is coming through you. And so I feel like it's been a process, like it's been like a 15 year pregnancy of like, just like 
you know, I, I'm serious. Like, I don't know how else to describe it. It's been its own entity and I've been resistant and then accommodating and then resistant and then accommodating. But really, I think it had its own energy that it wanted to communicate. And during the writing process, I would hear it narrating in my mind. Like, I don't know how other uh, writers write, but for me, a lot of it was a transcription of like what I was hearing about my own story. And then I would read it back and I'd be like, whoa, like, <laughs> what? And I would get feedback from you, like, this writing is really beautiful. And I'd be like, I know, isn't it really beautiful? Like, almost like surprise, like, at, like, what was coming through, you know, like, yeah, you're right. That's like, really beautiful. So um, a lot of like that, I, I don't know if you would call it channeling or whatever, divine inspiration, like, I don't know what language you would use, but I really do feel like it had a life of its own when it was coming through. And it must have had intention, because it is impacting others. And those people are receiving in a way that's creating some kind of an emotional reaction or heart opening or change or inspiration for them to also do some writing. So I think I think it's doing what it was meant to do. And I think I was like a channel for that, a vessel for that in some way. And I do feel the second book dropping in and wanting to come through as well. And what's interesting, and I don't know, I don't have any children, but I'm assuming pregnancy might be similar. The energy of the second book that's dropped in feels completely different than the energy of the first book. Like it just feels like it has a different personality and a different texture and a different sentience. Like it just feels like something else that's different. And you had said to me, even when we were doing this manuscript, like, Gabby, I know there's so much more that you need to tell. And I was like, yeah, but it's different. The, the, the one that's coming in now, the quality is so different. I can't put it with this first one because there's actually a completion here and something else is coming through. And so that's been my experience. And I don't know if that resonates with other writers or not. Well, it certainly resonates with me as a writer as well as with a coach. I mean, I do think there are there are books that feel to me like they are dropped down, as you described, or channeled, whatever word somebody wants to use yeah. about it. It's a very different feeling from when you're manufacturing something with your mind. You know, there are times that I'm writing and I can feel I am doing the work and it's kind of effortful. And then there's these other times, like you said, where you can hear these voices in your head. I always laugh about that, right? Like with my first novel, The Doula. I used to think I wasn't an, a, a, a fiction writer. I was I was writing memoir and I, I really um, appreciated fiction writers. I was like, how do they do that? I don't know how they make stuff up. Like I, I just, that wasn't my forte. And literally with the doula, I woke up in bed one morning with this woman's voice in my head. And it was the first line of the book. And yeah. I kind of looked around like, am I crazy? <laughs> like, what is happening here? Kind of worried for my mental health. But then she just kept talking to me and it was like, oh, wait a minute. I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to like write this down for this woman. And that's yeah. how I wrote my first book. My first fiction book was, was from that place of just listening really deeply to this voice that just kept showing up. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert in Big Magic, her book about creativity and writing talks too about this, this sense that like there's certain wisdom that wants to come down for humanity at any given time. Yeah. And I love her, I love her as sort of a cautionary tale because one of the tales she tells in that book is about her experience with Anne Patchett where Elizabeth had yes. been working on a novel. The <laughs> yeah. yeah, she'd been working on a novel and she put it <sighs> aside to work on her book about marriage. And then like a year later, she was at a writer's conference and she meets Anne Patchett and they start talking. She's asking Anne what she's working on. Anne starts describing Elizabeth's novel. And Elizabeth's like, I was working on that and I put that down and they figured out that like the time between when Elizabeth put the topic down and Anne picked it up was like literally 24 hours. And so I often caution my writers who have difficulty with accountability or making time and space to work on their projects. You know, I'll say like, hey, here's the deal. If this information wants to be here on the planet, it's going to come whether you say yes or not. But the thing is, like, if you really want to put this book out there, you got to do it. Because if you don't, you're going to walk into a bookstore, you're going to see your book with somebody else's name on the cover because somebody else will have written it because the information wants to be here. So I love that, you know, you were hearing that call, you were getting that information and then you're bringing it down. And in, in regard to the second book, as I was thinking about our interview today, I was thinking about this idea of like, there's, there's like a time and a space where we need to process the past, right? We need to work through the trauma. We need to make sense of what's happened to us and all of our experiences. And ideally we move off the victim 
point on like the triangle of disempowerment and we move more into like an empowered actor being an empowered actor in our own lives and so i'm wondering if for you if the second book isn't more about that point like the first book is here's what's happened and here's how i've worked with it honored it healed it right Mm -hmm. and book two is more like this is the exciting point is when you're standing at that threshold and you're looking out on the horizon it's like i now have the tools and the wisdom and the wherewithal to create what i want to create that's going to bring me more joy and perhaps be like that place that Fred Buchner talks about so beautifully, where he says something like where your deep gladness and the world's deep need intersect is, is your, yeah. job, right. That's your place. Yeah. That's your purpose. That's your mission. And so yeah. I'm so excited. Do you want to give us a little sneak peek into the second book? <laughs> Tell me a little bit about yeah, it. Yeah. So the last chapter of the first book is where I do this really deep um, therapeutic process to really kind of confront my demons once and for all and that's where we end the first book is like I've been on this healing journey for like two decades and I've been chasing healing and chasing healing and I finally like really have a confrontational experience and you get the unfolding of all the things that kind of had been the the um the aspects of my shadow that I had been avoiding that really kind of are confronted in that um, therapeutic journey. And so what happened in life for me where that book ends is then I started to work very closely with the earth and doing plant medicine and psychedelic medicine and doing farm work and um, working with my hands in the dirt, in the land, doing herbalism, doing permaculture. And that just like rewired and regenerated my whole being in a way that I wasn't anticipating or expecting. And so the second book is very much a rebirth and a rebirth that's like very ingrained with the planet, our relationship to the planet, how we need to regenerate collectively as a whole. And that rebirth and that regrowth that I think all of us are you know, pursuing or at least aspiring to pursue. And so that's what I'm exploring in these other stories. And I've verbally told some of these stories in like plant medicine circles or, you know, in intimate groups of friends and people are already like, whoa, (laughs) like, whoa, because what's really nice about this is that because I've ingested and I've communed with the planet and with the plants so intimately for the last couple of years, I feel like their voices are inside of me. And I feel like a lot of the voice that's gonna come through in the second book is gonna be the voice of the mushrooms and of the vegetables and of the flowers and of the volcanoes and of the hot springs. Like I feel like a lot of their voice is what's gonna come through in the second one. And, and I do feel so much more contentment and joy in that because so much of the voice that was coming through in the first book was the shadow and it was the trauma and it was the pain and that was like a hard voice to hold which is why I had to take these long breaks in between drafts because when you hold that like you're holding it in every cell of your being it becomes who you are during that process it's a very like physical experience for me and so now like to be writing from this place of these like delightful beings um, and sentience it's like it's just a very different experience and I do feel a lot lighter than I did in in writing the 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 previous memoir oh that's so beautiful and I'm like chuckling as you're talking because I'm thinking about the beginning of the book where you started out as a as a late teenager early 20s like fashion modeling in in Europe and New York City and everything else right and your trajectory has just been so fascinating to to watch you move from fashion model to PhD to healer extraordinaire and teacher extraordinaire and now into this next phase and I just am so thrilled and excited for you to continue to lighten up in the way that you are and to do what you're doing to lighten up the planet. Yeah. How do you feel about the um, process of coaching? I'd love to hear a little bit about like the energetics and mindset tools that you know that I bring as a shamanic practitioner to my work with my clients. Was that supportive for you? And if so, how? And uh, anything you want to yeah. share about that process? I mean, the only reason this book is in the world is because of you. Oh, <laughs> And I mean that with total sincerity. I had a call with you um, in February of 2022 and I had been interviewing editors and I had worked briefly with some editors. The whole process was 
arduous and uncomfortable. And like, it just never, it always felt like the shoes were too small or too big, you know, something wasn't right. And I had a call with you because I was hoping to publish with She Writes, which I didn't end up choosing, but um, they referred me to you. And I had a call with you and I like immediately liked you on the call because you were like, like you gave no fucks in the conversation. You were like, okay, Gabby, I hear you. I feel like I'm in alignment with this project. Like, when do you want to start working on it? And I was like, well, I've been farming for the last couple of years and I don't have any money. And you were like, well, go get the money. (laughs) That's what you said to me. You're like, go get the money. And I was like, I was like, who is this lady? I was like, why? This is ridiculous. And then you were like, you said to me, like, you know how to manifest stuff. Go manifest the money and call me back when you have the money. And I was like, oh, like <laughs> offended and also like super impressed at the same time. I was like, this lady's got big balls. So I hung up the phone with you and I was like, fuck this. And then I went and I like got this fancy job and they were paying like tens of thousands of dollars a month, a month. And I was like putting it away and putting it away and putting it away. And it took me you know, I think I called you back in October, it wasn't that so long. maybe, maybe like eight months, months later. later. And I was like, I got the money. Bridget. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> and you're like, good, let's do this. And then we like jumped right back in, like where we had left off, like in the previous conversation. And like, it's the best choice I ever made. You're worth every single penny. Like this book only came through because like you held the space for it and one of the things that I would say to anybody who's considering working with you is I said to you in the beginning like I cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel I am going to surrender to you I'm going to do everything you tell me to do and you better fucking get this book out into the world because I can't do it and you were like I will get it out I guarantee you that we will get this done and I was like okay and then like even for like the first couple of weeks when you were giving me notes I was like I hate her notes I don't want to follow her notes but like I had already made the commitment and I had, you know, I told my best friend, I'm committing to this woman. I think she's badass. I'm committing to it. My friend was like, then you need to commit. Like, don't be stubborn. Don't push back. Just do whatever she tells you to do. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. And so that's what I did. And and I feel like that was important for me to just completely trust you like a hundred percent and not to be like, yeah, but like, I don't want to do it like that. Like, because I feel like for you, you really do hold the whole thing like you really can see the book in its completion which I couldn't see it in its completion I could feel it but I couldn't see it in its like materialization completion but you had already done this so many times with so many authors that you were like no the book is done like let me just help you get it you know physically out and I was like okay whatever so it for me it was like picking you, loving you, trusting you, surrendering to you, and just like letting the process happen. It is so much, you know, as you're talking, it's like, it reminds me, it's so much like a childbirth. I, you know, I work as a doula for literal births, <laughs> baby births, as well as book births. And it's, it always sort of um, stuns me how similar that creative process is, no matter what you're birthing, right. And to yeah. have somebody walk alongside you, which, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful. I've had my own mentors who have done that for me, my own book coaches, including Jeff Davis, who helped me birth the doula. Mm-hmm. Um, but that process of, allowing yourself to bring in that support and really like call it in. Right. And I want to, I want to talk about that money piece for a bit, cause it's really important. I, um, I think particularly as women, we sometimes, we don't want to invest in ourselves, right? We feel bad about investing yeah. in ourselves and our businesses mm-hmm. and our projects, especially our creative projects, especially if there's a fear mm-hmm. around like, will this even pay off? Will this book go mm-hmm. anywhere, reach an audience, et cetera. And, um, to be able to acknowledge that when we step into this role, we're saying to spirit, like, Hey, I'm hearing this call, right? I'm hearing this call that this story needs to be out there. I'm willing to do it. But then like sitting across the table from spirit and negotiating your terms, like I'm willing to show up and put in the time and the effort and the energy, but you got to bring me a a book doula. You got to bring me the resources to pay that person. I said that. No, I said that to the universe for like the whole last year, I was taking these beach walks and I kept saying, you got to give me the money. You got to give me the editor. Like I'm, I did my part. You have to show up for me. I did. And I told this to someone else too. And they said, you just like asked the universe. And I was like, yeah, I was like, these are the terms. If you want this, these are the terms. And my friend was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Like, 
And isn't it amazing? What's, what's more amazing is not only do we ask, but what comes back to us, right? What gets reflected back is we get what we need. When we stand in that place of our self-empowerment, which is our, like our third chakra or that will center in the middle of our body, right? We really root in there and we're super clear. Like this is aligned with our purpose and our mission for being here on the planet. Everything we need suddenly just shows up and it's, it's such a brilliant process. And I think it's a really important piece. I know personally, when I'm, when I'm ready to take in a new client, I sit down and I put that call out there. I energetically like send out a little signal. It's like, Hey, I'm ready for somebody who's willing to work as hard as I am because my time and energy is really precious and pretty limited. I'm a single parent. I've got my own creative projects. So the projects I take on, I want to feel a hundred percent invested in. And I want to feel like you said, like I can see the end product before it's created. Right. Um, it always reminds me, I kind of chuckle because as a kid, I love to do puzzles and puzzles are rearranging, taking pieces and putting them in a particular order so that they make a, a beautiful picture. And for me, it's sort of like the queen's gambit where she saw the chess pieces on the ceiling. I feel like I can always see like, the scenes of the chapters and they start rearranging themselves until that finished product is there. But really it wasn't until I did my shamanic training that I understood that like quantum physics teaches that time is collapsible. So the book, this is already done before you put a word on the page. Age, right. It's just a matter yeah. of accessing that, which is a really different yeah. process for most people than writing from up here again. It's yeah. so different. And, yeah. and I, I will say like, it tickles me pink that this is what I get to do all day because it does combine those skills of like logic and analysis and moving stuff around with this more sort of like woo woo piece of like, just open yourself, be the container, let it flow through you. And I, I just love watching clients like you be in that process because what happens is alchemical magic, right? We take these. Well, your magic, it's your well, magic. We're doing the magic together. There's, you know, we're co-creating that magic and we're bringing this down. And yeah. It's just so, always so interesting to see what does spirit show up with, right? Because yes. we get some really magical things. Yes. Were there any moments in the book that surprised you? Like anything that you wrote about that you were like, wow, I didn't really know that that's what was going on until I wrote the whole know, thing. All of it. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of epiphany after thing. another in that book. <laughs> well, I mean, what was great with, with our process is like, I put a lot of narrative, but you asked me to insert some reflection on the narrative in a couple of key places that like I wouldn't have done. And you're like, okay, but what did this mean? Can you get, just give, put in a paragraph right before here that says like, what is it about your relationships or what is it about secrets or what is it about like a couple key places where I put in, I think you called it exposition. I'm not sure the language mm -hmm. that you used around it, but there was like some places where you asked me to drop in the insight that I got from that particular piece of narrative. And I feel like that really just anchored the whole thing. And that's something that I hear people quoting back to me, some of the things that I wrote in those pieces, like one of the lines is you're only as sick as your secrets. People say that to me when I meet them, that line, you know, or like, so I think when you kind of pushed me to do that, that piece of it, and it doesn't happen very often in the book, maybe half a dozen times. Um, I think that was like a really critical piece that needed to be there that I hadn't previously anticipated. Well, and that's the great observation because to my mind, there's like reasons for different drafts, right? And so early drafts, well, let me say it this way. One of the things that we love about reading memoir is people's particular points of view, right? We get to step into somebody else's shoes, experience life through their eyes. And that's fascinating. When, when the story is fascinating, it's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and when the voice is fascinating, when the particular person you know, has a really unique, interesting voice, we love to do that. And um, what I've noticed is oftentimes we have to draft the like, what happened? That's the first draft or second or third draft is just getting the lay of the land of like, what is the material? What's the experiences I've had? And then we go back in and we start to add in that more introspective piece, the how did I feel about what was happening? How did that impact my decisions next? Right. And that's like a whole other overlay that generally comes mm -hmm. after you've gotten the lay of the land with just the, here's what happened and when it happened, basically. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. right, glad that you were able to, um, talk about that as well. So let's move on to like this idea of publishing. So there's writing the book, right? And, and for many of us, just getting the words on the page can be a challenge. And that's a big accomplishment is getting a, a draft that we think is close to ready to go out in the world. And then there's actually taking your baby and putting it on Amazon, right? which is a whole different process because now you're being seen and heard ideally, which we both want. And usually we're kind of terrified about it at the same time. So how is that going for you so far? How pleased are you with your publishing process? Tell us a little bit about the, the way that you decided to publish, because it's not um, necessarily the more, most traditional route and why you chose that. 
Yeah. Well, I was interviewed on a podcast this week and the guy asked me a similar question and I said, I published everything in the book that I don't want anybody to know about me. (laughs) (laughs) If you think about all of the things that you don't want people to know about you, that's what's in the book. He was like, he was like, that sounds really vulnerable. And I'm like, yeah, it was a terrible experience. And he was like, wow. And so (laughs) the terribleness was that I had built up like a lifetime of belief around the fact that being that vulnerable could only have negative consequences, right? Like people wouldn't love me. People would shun me. Like there would be, I don't know, some kind of global event where things would be, you know, (laughs) the earth would tip on its axis, meteors would hit the earth. Like maybe you're the cause of all the snow we're having up here in Northern California. (laughs) I swear that like frogs just are coming next. So I'm going to call you frogs. Exactly. Exactly. So I had built up like catastrophic expectations around vulnerability, which whatever, that's stupid. So, um, so that I think, you know, that was something that needed to be like processed, like as I was kind of moving through, you know, the a great title there. Yeah. So that was something that I had to, you know, move through on the publishing journey. And it was something that I had to kind of go through stages, um, you know, and kind of integrate as I went along. And then what happened was when it came out, there was an overwhelming positive response where I started getting a lot of messages and comments and outreach telling me like how much people were appreciating the book and how much they were loving the book and how much they were learning from the book. And then I had to like confront my own limiting beliefs about my own value. And I had to like integrate all that love and appreciation and whatever. And then that was like a whole nother level of healing. I think that happens once you get the opposite reaction from what you're expecting, because you're expecting people to reject you. And then they tell you how amazing you are. And then you're like, Oh, now everyone thinks I'm amazing. And then you have to like integrate all of that, you know? So I I would just tell people like, it's not going to be anything like you expect it to be like nothing in the journey has been what I expected. It's like only been this constant unfolding of surprises and transformation and the actual process, like actual logistical process of publishing was um, both easier and more expensive than I expected. I've already spent over $30,000 just in like editing and publishing and marketing and whatever. And I don't even think that's like a significant amount compared to what I've heard other people spending. I know I I have one friend who works for like a fancy life coach and she spent like $300,000 or something ridiculous, you know? So it's been a lot more expensive, but I also see the value in the money that I spent. And at some point I had to come to terms with like, I'm going to spend a lot of money. I could buy a car with this money. Like at some point I had to really kind of come to terms with, I'm going to spend the money and I need to be okay with that money not coming back. If it doesn't come back, I I needed to not have that desperation or that attachment to that money coming back to me for my own personal sanity, right? Like I couldn't be counting every dollar going out and, and counting it coming back in again. So, I mean, I would say to anybody that's planning to do this well, like to create a finished product that you're really proud of and that's really professional, put away some money and plan to spend the money and not be too worried about, you know, what the ROI on that money is going to be. Because I still, at this point, the book has been published for a month. I still have no idea. Like, and, and what I'm doing right now is I'm putting away another $30,000 for the next book. Just like, as I'm making money, I'm just like setting more money aside because this is something I care about and I want to spend the money. But like, I had no idea that I was getting into this kind of financial commitment when I started. And um, I think it's something that people should be aware of. I, I don't feel like there's enough transparency on publishing. And and I think there's like a lot of weird, um, I don't know, like ambiguity around publishing, especially when it comes to like traditional publishing or hybrid publishing or or, you know, self-publishing and what are they and, and, and what can you expect and what are the benefits and what are the drawbacks and what are the royalties and what are the, you know, 
I think it's very, very confusing. And I feel bad for most authors that are on this journey because it takes a long time to figure it out, how to work with people with integrity, how to like manage your budget around this, how to make the right choices. I feel like I got really lucky because I'm happy with the outcome. I'm happy with my editor, I'm happy with my publisher, but like, you know, it could have turned out you know, in any number of ways that I may or may not have been happy with. So it's been a very significant learning journey, this whole process. Yeah, it's definitely like an an education in a whole industry that you do need to, I think Mm -hmm. as an author, you need to be well read on, right? Well versed in so that you do know um, what choices are going to best benefit you and your business and um, help you move forward so that you are making that investment from a place of feeling good about it. And you're right. I mean, it is a significant yeah. investment. And I have often felt both for myself personally as an author and as for my clients, what it'll do, like, like, you know, anything we need to learn in our lives is going to come up through our life. Right. And so what it does often is again, it, it brings up for people, their lack, their, their scarcity mentality. If you have any issues around money, this is going to be a place where it is going it, to, it, it'll bring it up for you to look at it and either grow from it or not, depending on what you choose to do. Right. But I love your, totally. I, I, you know, I'm saying yes to the project. I'm committed. That means the, the resources are going to be here and I'm going to spend them. And then I'm going to, yeah. perhaps maybe, you know, one thing I would add to that is like, I encourage my clients to stay in that place of assume that the result is what you want and then act as if that's already happened, right? So it's like, this book is going to be a benefit to me in my life. It won't be a waste of my time and money. And therefore, let me start looking for evidence of that now. And we create from our minds, our reality, right? So our thinking then supports things coming in, whether that's more book sales or a course you get to offer as a result of writing the book or a business opportunity. We don't know how it's all going to play out. But I often feel that way, even about the doula, that that book's been out since 2012. And, you know, I, things start popping in the universe that bring in opportunities because that book's out there. And that has nothing to do with the book sales necessarily in terms of the, the dollar amount, right? But it's like yeah. there's opportunities. So I think you're a great example of this. Like, I'm going to continue to put out what my heart and my spirit are inviting me to put out and trust that what I need is going to show up. And that yeah. it, whether it's 30,000 or 300,000, it really doesn't matter, the dollar amount, right? right? Like the resources are going to be there. Um, and finally, I want to just point out, I have my mug here for my dear friend since the latch poem grown. And this mug says, be more sacred than scared. And I picked this today because it just so I think um, illustrates who you are and your personality. You know, with, as you're writing this, all this killing is he- healing me. You're saying, I'm going to be more sacred than I am scared. We do get scared, right? We do have to confront our past at times. You went deep into your childhood and into trauma and challenges that you had with your family of origin, and then through your experiences with dating and relationships overall, right? Friendships and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I can only say like a hearty thank you to you. I learned so much from working with you on your book and I'm honored to have been able to be on that journey with you. Um, I'd love for you as a wrap up here, let us know where listeners can connect with you. And also if you do have some podcasts podcasts or um, workshops or something coming up, share those right now too, and um, share your website. So that yeah. Thank you. So my website is just my name, gabriellepolici.com. And there's a press page there with all of the podcast interviews that I've been doing. Um, I think I have seven or eight podcast interviews this month alone. So there's quite a bit of content that's coming out around that. Um, and you can follow me, follow me at Dr. Gabby Polici on all of the social media channels like Instagram and Twitter and LinkedIn and things like that. And I'm happy to connect. And hopefully, you know, we were talking before we started this interview, hopefully you and I can co-create something for the audience in the future to support them through this process, to help them navigate, to make it a little bit more easier to kind of birth these books into the world. So I'm just putting that out there to manifest that. And if people have interest in that, I would also love to to be connected in that way. So yeah, please, you know, connect, let me know your thoughts on the book and uh, I'll ping you when the next book is ready and we can, you know, continue the conversation. Yes. And on my end, modernmuseforwriters.com, you can check out the workshops and the retreats that we have coming. They're launching our first retreat, June 17th through the 24th. So that's coming up in just a few short months. There'll also be a um, writer's pilot program coming up in September to watch for. And as Gabrielle mentioned, we are going to try and do something together, um, some kind of a program for people as well to help other writers who want to birth their books in the world like she did. Gabby, thank you so much again. Really appreciate you taking the time and the um, energy today to be with me. It was awesome to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Great to see you again. We'll talk soon. 
Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.